you know, for years, you know, skateboard parks all across the country had half pipes. And that was really the only place you could find a half pipe. Well, snowboarding was in such an early, at such an early level, an early stage in, in the early 80s that when I got a call from Mike Chantry that there was a quarter pipe in the woods made out of snow, I said, let's go check it out. I, I got to see this. So Mike Chantry and I and Terry Kidwell, we go marching into the woods behind Tahoe City in, in North Lake Tahoe. And as it turns out, it had been a, a dump, a city dump many decades ago. So a bulldozer had scooped out dirt to cover garbage. And so they had an in run and then one hit, just one hit. Well, I, I, th I always thought it was me and Alan four-wheeling in the woods and we found it, but Bob Klein says it was Mark Analik that, that told us about this ditch. And, and that's probably what happened. And then me and Alan Armbruster went up there in the summer and checked it out. And we just waited for winter so we could uh, dig it out and ride it. So at the same time in my life, I'm, I'm trying to put on a snowboard contest on the West Coast to try to get the sport off the ground. And after taking a few runs in this quarter pipe, I said to myself, when I put on this big snowboard contest in, in, in Tahoe, I think I'll, I'll have a half pipe. So I said to myself, we'll get the ski area to you know, pile up the snow, we'll scoop it out, and then we'll be able to make multiple hits. And so they got their snow cat out there and piled up the snow and built the first half pipe. And of course, the Sims team riders were all competent skateboarders and they ripped it up which wasn't too uh, didn't make the Burton team from back east very happy as they saw the half pipe as sort of a, a threat to the whole alpine scene which was sort of their their deal kind of looking at it back then those guys actually could get air they knew how to ride they just want, didn't want to do it and they were afraid they're gonna get hurt because I know Coughlin actually wound up, he would make the finals in a couple of events that I judged. And we were like, don't tell me you can't ride the pipe. But they all had to do it because it was an overall title and there was overall money involved. So you still had to do the freestyle. But they would do the minimum they had to do to get points, you know, towards the overall title. He was the catalyst for having half pipe in snowboard competitions. Without him, it would have been the linear. Here's the start, here's the beam at the bottom you have to go through. So you got a wand, you got a start, you got gates. So I mean that's without Tom Sims's influence and he had the pull and the juice at the time, he actually got freestyle competitions off the ground and for that, you know, that's invaluable. So trying to get freestyle snowboarding and the half pipe riding off the ground was actually a battle as the, the, the Burton team organized a boycott of the half pipe until I convinced them that, you know, it's fun. <laughs> and they just didn't see how it fit into snowboarding. A lot of times you'd see Palmer and Palmer and Terry and, and some of the other guys, they'd be in the DNS or DNFs. They did not finish because they would blow out a gate and just go, ah, screw it and pull off, you know. They would just show up and just go, and they'd knock gates down and get disqualified and everything. They'd still get minimum points, but you know, they're the freestyle points because they were really like the top two or three all the time. <laughs> As far as I know, that, that first video, at least for my part, it was just a maybe three days worth of filming. I mean, there wasn't too many takes where it was like, okay, do it again. We just pretty much filmed and then they just edited it and, and took some of the best stuff and put it in the video. Yeah, for the time, I think, you know, people saw that video and were just blowing away. Like, you know, the most people couldn't really link cars together at the time. There was definitely a big group of riders that could, but the general public was pretty blown away. Like, wow, you can do that on a snowboard? 
This video wasn't made to sell snowboarding. It was made to sell The Sims team. There's a big difference there. You know, if you saw One Track Mind, that video was made to appeal to a 40-year-old dude who's a general manager of a ski area. It wasn't made to appeal to a 16-year-old, you know, Vermonter who's bummed because he can't skate in the winter. You know, 82, 83, 84, um, it was like a bidding war for riders, you know, who had the hottest team. And after Tom came out with the hot freestyle team, and Jake, all he had was racers who were, you know, the East Coast guys, and they didn't know freestyle from beans. And we come out, we got the skateboarders and the big air guys, you know, they're just going, chucking everything, which was kind of like they were trying to one-up each other around then. We had completely different visions of where the sport should go. I felt that team riders were very important, so uh, he also felt that the half pipe should be banned from competition. So these sort of disagreements led to a feud. And then I think the, the culmination of our uh, disagreements is when they recruited Craig Kelly from our team. And uh, I, I felt like he was my brother when we were snowboarding and, and he, was, he had such great style and it was such a good influence on the other team riders. And then I really vi envisioned him someday becoming, you know, marketing director or someday president of the company. Craig Kelly was like late 80s. Um, you know, we'd been friends, I'm not sure when we first met, uh, sort of mid 80s, but um, we had a relationship for a long time and I'd always known him and I told him, I said, hey, if things ever don't work out with your, you know, sponsor, let me know. And I think he had it in the back of his mind too. And, he knew we were making boards in Vermont right there, and we were pretty committed to making stuff better. You know, what Craig did for the sport was incredible, and I think that we had a big role in that, you know, giving him that opportunity and believing in, in him and, you know, getting behind his, you know, designs. And Jake saw in Craig um, the ability to kind of change focus on his company from a racing company to what it is now. Because at that point, Burton, Burton was Burton, but they uh, they weren't the coolest. You know, they 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 were East Coast. Sims was the West Coast. It was Terry Kidwell, Sean Palmer, Craig Kelly. That's what Jake had in mind. You know, whereas Tom was dead serious and you know, pretty much paved the way for Jake. But at the same time, I think Craig took Jake more seriously as a business partner, and I think they shared a vision together. So it wasn't so much some personal thing with Tom Sims. So it's like. Craig wasn't even dealing with Tom Sims back then, he was dealing with vision. And that, that's who the issue is with. Like, if, if there was anything you could say Craig didn't like about Sims snowboards, it was, it was Brad Dorfman. Um, he was riding for Sims, Sims at the time, and then Sims got bought by, do you remember Vision Streetwear? I'm sure, yeah, that whole scene. So they, um, Brad Dorfman, who was, a, who was a very nice guy, but he'd bought Sims sort of, because I think Sims was having maybe some financial issues, so he wasn't super committed to it at the time. And I think, you know, Greg knew that. He just saw it as an opportunity to, to move on. So he got in touch with us. And, and then we got sued by them because they weren't, you know, they decided that they really wanted Craig. And, or they sued Craig. And I guess they sued us too, but mainly they went after Craig and for violating his contract, which didn't really exist. And that dragged things out for like a year. We got that all resolved. That's, that's almost when you could kind of see from the outside. You could see what, that these inside players took it serious enough to escalate it be it Craig, with wherever he was going in his life, and Sims and Burton. I just look at that as the watershed moment of, so here's snowboarding growing up. Here's it becoming a legitimate sport when all of a sudden you have these legitimate nuisances like lawsuits. Right around the time that Craig won the World Snowboard Championships was also right around the time that I was on the verge of getting financing so, so we could grow the company. So. Uh, you know, he was world champion, and, and all of a sudden, I find out that he's being recruited by Burton for a, you know, a phenomenal amount of money, and of course, I didn't have that much money at the time, so that's sort of when the sport sort of took a big change in direction from being very soulful and grassroots to going on its way to becoming a mainstream big bucks industry, and so losing a big chunk of the team right then was uh, at a time that jeopardized the whole financing part of it. And then all of a sudden this court battle enraged, you know, like uh, Tom was trying to stop the 
you know, shifting of Craig away. And so Craig had to ride like blackboards this whole year. And um, I lived with Craig and saw all this stuff going on, just going, wow, Burton, if they actually do get Craig, it will make them cool, you know? And, and you know, it's Craig that drew in Terrier. It's Craig that drew in Brushy. It's Craig that drew in all of those guys that, you know, helped shape the face of Burton in the late 80s, early 90s. And, and it's very, very respectable that and smart of Jake to to get Craig on board because that's that's changed everything for Burton. It, so it was pretty it was pretty uh, pretty unique situation to just be sitting on the inside of that ring, just going, "Wow, I wonder how this is going to pan out." And then watching it pan out and and watching you know kind of like an empire rise, you know. I was I was uh, somewhat. Uh you know, disillusioned for a while about where the sport was going when I realized that if you had a lot of money, you could have a lot of influence on this sport. And then immediately thereafter, Rosignol and K2 all jump in and tried to take the sport away from, you know, the founding fathers. So it was, uh, it, it was a wild time, you know, try, trying to hang in there. And, uh, it was just one of those unfortunate things, and you know, Craig was one of the greatest guys in the whole world. And I went to a half a dozen banks with the idea of snowboarding. They said, there's no way that snowboarding will ever make it. I went to the banks to get skateboarding financed, and they said, there's no way that skateboarding will ever become a big sport. And the same thing with wakeboarding, and the same thing with surfing. So don't go to the bankers if you're uh, looking for vision or... Uh, new ideas. <laughs> they won't even loan you money with a good idea. So I had to finance. My dad loaned me $25,000 in the early 70s to get the business off the ground and we just had to grow very slowly uh, since we weren't able to get financing because board sports and, and uh, conservative banks just weren't made for each other. They'd gotten burned in the windsurfing fad and uh, and of course, I never believed that skateboarding or snowboarding or wakeboarding or any of that was a fad. I, I, I thought it was a lifestyle. And it's true because it doesn't matter whether you're skateboarding or wakeboarding or snowboarding. Um, it's, all, it's all that same feeling of turning. And, and, uh, and so these boards sort of reflect, you know, a lifestyle, which is, you know, boarding. And so I'm proud to have been a part of it. I got it. Drop it, Tom! <laughs> Some thickness there. <laughs> Go how'd straight you, down, man! How'd you like seeing that avalanche come at you? Was there? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> that was sticky, but that's a heck of a nice peak up there. Got a little crusted up already, eh? Uh, yeah, the sun really was cooking it for a couple hours there. Uh -huh. It took us two hours to hike it, and in that time it got fried, but it was still a ball. Uh -huh. So we might have to climb up there again. Yeah, right. <laughs> you can see it from here. Oh, uh, yeah, you can. Oh, go. there it is. It's behind that knob. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, it's, it's right right in the, the, the off the peak. Right when it just narrows. Just a tiny bit left. Right in there. Right where it yeah. narrows. God, all of a sudden, I started pushing me like a web, and I'm like, I better get my ass out of here. <laughs> so, good when you're up did you there. see me paddling? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I paddled out of it, and I'm going, shit, my tip, if I can just keep the tip up, I'll get my ass out up of here. Up on the top, you're yes, making some there. nice turns, those big, big, wide ones. I probably should have ridden my ace in. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I couldn't have gotten the nose out.